Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Project Egg Show. I hope you like our very new intro. We're totally testing it out, and so I think it's pretty awesome, but let me know what you think. Anyways, today we have the honor of speaking with Matt Morris. How are you doing today, Matt? I'm awesome, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for being here because I'm so happy to ask you the question, what is your story? Ah, all right. Well... So I don't know where you want me to start, but um, the very we'll beginning, see. the very beginning, like childhood. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll go way back then. So uh, let's see. Uh, I guess what's interesting, uh, what people find interesting anyway, uh, parents divorced when I was about four. Uh, my father uh, picked me up one weekend to spend the weekend with me, with me. And uh, dropped me off at my grandparents, saying that he, we, you know, he had to work, and he actually drove to my my house where my mom was with her new uh, boyfriend, and murdered um, my mother's boyfriend. So, uh, dad went to prison, and that was an interesting experience as a kid because you know you have football games and field days and things like that, and you know friends would say, "Hey, where's your dad?" And, I'd say he's out of town, which was true. <laughs> he was. So, um, you know, he got out of prison, alcoholic, uh, major alcoholic, and, uh, you know, moving around a lot, you know, losing jobs, different things like that. And um, then when my mom, single mom, working, you know, two and three jobs to work her way through college, she's actually my hero. She uh, finished college as a single mom, finished law school as a single mom, became an attorney uh, by the time I got to high school, and um, actually just a few years ago retired as a judge. So, uh, you know, she's definitely a big inspiration for me. And then uh, going back, you know, my father committed suicide when I was 13. Um, I decided to get into the business world, uh, the entrepreneurial world, uh, joined, well, joined the U.S. Marine Corps right after high school, went into the reserves, went to college. Uh, the Marine Corps gave me a lot of confidence, so I decided I was going to be pre-med. That lasted a whole semester. <laughs> failed chemistry, failed biology, realized I was not cut out for medicine, transferred to the economic school, calculus 101. I failed it, like not even close took the exact same class the next semester, I still failed it. <laughs> so I figured I'm not really cut out for economics either. So basically became an entrepreneur because I just felt like I didn't have a lot of other options. It excited me, you know, the whole thought of owning my own life and controlling my destiny, making a lot of money because I grew up without a, a lot of money. So that was always, uh, you know, a big desire there to, you know, make some make some money and live comfortably. And so, you know, just went head first, dropped out of college. And, uh, you know, after my first two years as an entrepreneur, I was had enough success that I was able to move into a really amazing place, um, my Honda Civic. <laughs> so I took a job selling swimming pools in Louisiana, couldn't afford uh, hotels or an apartment or anything like that. So for two months, I slept out of my car until my commissions came in from selling pools. And, you know, that was a great learning experience. Not uh, a ton of fun while I was in the situation, but <laughs> tons of learning coming out. And someone had given me an article called What the Cell is Going On. And it talked about how every cell in the human body regenerates itself every three to seven years. So seven years from now, we won't have a single cell in our body that we have now. And you can reinvent your health based on what you put into it and exercise and all these things, right? And so I just remember reading that thinking, man, I'm at this incredibly low point in my life. There's nothing wrong with my body, but my financial life, my career life, everything else is like in the toilet. So... I, I kind of started this reinvention process. I'm like, oh, well, if you can reinvent your health, I can reinvent my success. So I got to put the right things in. And I had listened to a Tony Robbins cassette and he talked about his story of going from being broke to becoming a millionaire and changing his body and all this stuff. And he said he read over 700 books. 
and anything he could get his hands on as it related to success and mindset and all that. And he talked about the concept of modeling. And if you want something, figure out someone who has it, figure out what they did, do what they did, and you, you can have it yourself. And I thought, well, I don't really have anything to model from a business standpoint. I'm selling above ground swimming pools. Um, I don't have have any business I'm after right now. I don't really, I'm living out of my car. I don't have a mentor, so to speak, but I can model him and the fact that he read a bunch of books. And so I started reading personal development like crazy, like a huge obsession because I just realized, number one, I had to take responsibility for where I was. I got myself into the situation, no one else. And by taking that responsibility, I have the power to get myself out and that will happen through my hard work, but also my skills and ability and my mindset and all that. And so I would read a new book every two or three days. I uh, couldn't afford a lot of books. Any money I had, it was investing into personal education. And then I would literally go to the bookstore. I'd read the books on the shelf and I'd stay there until the bookstore would close. I'd turn, I'd put the book back on the bookshelf, remember what page I'm on, come back the next day and finish the book. And so it, it just started, that process started to change me and change my mindset, figure out how to change, you know, my own psychology, uh, learn skills that I didn't have previously. And so I did that for a period of years. And from age 21 to 24, at 24, I got to the point where I was earning a six figure income as an entrepreneur, traveling around the world. I started speaking a little bit and I looked back, actually, it was like a conscious thing where I'm like, man, my reinvention process worked. And I just decided to do it again. I had a goal of being a millionaire by the time I was 30. And so I just kept investing in myself, going to seminars, reading books, working like crazy, of course. You got to put in the hustle. And, uh, you know, at age 29, I was able to become a self-made millionaire. And, um, you know, lots of ups and downs along the way. At uh, 21, I was 30,000 in debt. At 26, I was 100,000 in debt. At 32, I was 750,000 in debt. And I'm 42 now. And uh, hopefully I've learned, uh, you know, I've, I've learned the lessons of how to uh, not just make it, but keep it. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's been a, a heck of a ride, an amazing journey. And, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change any of it. Holy shit. I do not hear stories like that every day. That is incredible. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, of course, man. So uh, when, when, when you were little and it seems like you had both a, a very difficult time and, and, and a lot of, a lot of sadness and, and difficulty uh, with with your father, and and then it seems like you have this incredible role model with your mother. How like how did that affect you at a at a at a deeply personal level? I mean, you're you're young, impressionable, and mm -hmm. it seems like that probably profoundly impacted you. And I'm just curious as to how it did. Yeah, I mean, I think like I I mean, uh, be real. I had a lot of issues with the stuff going on with my you know, father, as an example. I mean, that definitely affected me. And I don't think, like at the time when I was a kid, I wouldn't have said my mom is my hero just because I didn't have the awareness to see her incredible gifts. I didn't have the awareness to really understand how good she was to me. You know, you focus on um, the challenges. And so I was kind of like, you know, focused on that probably a little too much. And... You know, it was, um, I, I think the net out, like if I had to say, well, how did it affect me? Well, I felt very different, right? So I felt different than the other kids um, because I, what I saw, and maybe this is just what I was focusing on, is these happy families. My best friend had a mom and dad and a sister, and they did well financially, and they did family stuff together, and I didn't have that going on. I had just drama going on in my life, and other friends at school and things like that. It just, from the outside looking into their family, it looked like they had the perfect family, and I didn't. Now... It, it, from their perspective, they probably had some crazy stuff going on as well, but I'm not seeing that at the time. And, 
you know, I just, I think I had, thank goodness I had the connection with my mom. It, it made it, I think, so much easier. She was always there for me. I knew I could count on her. And so there was this sense of a, like a lack of love and security in one area, but then there was tremendous security and love in the other. So I had a little bit of uh a little bit of both, but there was definitely some, you know, anger and I was uh, getting fights all the time when I was in like elementary school and stuff like that. And I don't know, I think she was, uh, she was a good grounding though. So kind of helped me get through and, and I, you know, I, I, while it affected me, I, when I look back, like I know it bothered me, but I don't feel like it crippled me in any way. Like I felt different and embarrassed and I felt lack of love because it's like, well, if my father committed suicide, like surely if he really loved me, he wouldn't have done that. And there was a period of time for, it was probably a year I didn't hear from him, a year or more. I didn't hear from him at all. He had lost his job and moved to another state and he wasn't paying child support. So he probably didn't want to be in contact. So uh, <laughs> uh, who knows what was going on in his mind, but I didn't hear from him for like a year, over a year, right? So um, you know, those kind of things affect you, but you just kind of move on, right? So it, just, it is what it is, you know, looking back now, having done uh, a lot of personal development, a lot of work on myself and, uh, and all that, I can see the, the blessing behind it. You know, there was uh, every experience we have, we interpret it in a different way. So my father committed suicide. So I interpreted that as he really must not have loved me very much. I can go back now and I can reinterpret that experience and say, well, it wasn't because he didn't love me or my half brother at the time who was like a year old, it wasn't a lack of love. It was whatever the demons were going on in his mind. And, you know, um, what are the negative experiences that I took on to be negative back then, but what shaped me in a positive way? And so uh, how can I reframe it in my mind? So as an example, uh, at one point when I was living with my father and I was about 11 or so, uh, maybe 12, I lived with him for a short period of time, about nine months. And this experience is why I stopped living with him, but he put, he dropped me off at the uh, bookstore or sorry, the uh, library one night to do, cause I had a book report what I had to do. And he said, call me when you're done. So when I was done, I called him, no answer. I called him, no answer. And there was a payphone in the little um, waiting area in the library. And the library is closing. I've been trying to call him for like an hour, hour and a half, just not answering. And it's raining outside. Eventually they're closing the library. And so they asked me, are you okay? And I said, yeah, my dad's coming to pick me up. So I lied basically, cause I didn't want to be like, oh, my dad won't, it's not answering the phone. So they, you know, lock the door and the phone is inside. And so I can't call. And so we're living in another state, North Carolina at the time. I don't know the area real well, but I basically know the way home. It's a couple miles. So I run home a couple miles in the rain. I go into our apartment and he's passed out because he had been drinking. So he passed out drunk. And I immediately, it was like, all right, dad doesn't even love me enough to pick me up. It's more important for him to get drunk and pass out. So that's the meaning I associate and I carry around that meaning. And then years later, I, when I decided, all right, I've got the power to reinterpret some of these things that happened. And I look at that experience and I think, thank God he left me there because it taught me independence. It taught me that I could take care of myself. And so I look back and I'm like, all right, well, thanks dad. And I can look at it from a different perspective, one that empowers me, not disempowers me, because as long as I carry around that baggage of him not loving me, that's gonna show up in different areas of my life versus um, showing up in a way that is like, man, I've been powerful and independent since I was really young because of the things that happened. I think your story and the things that you're saying are so, so powerful for for people to to hear because I'm a very firm believer that we do have to take ownership for for our lives and for where we are. But I mean that's it's easy for me to say. But you know, for when when you're saying that, 
having come through so much and been through so much, that to me is so much more meaningful than than if I, if I could say. And so, you know, I'm I'm curious because I often ask myself this question of, okay, well, how much ownership can we really take in our lives? Mm -hmm. Like, what is the extent to that, right? Because at some level, we don't have control over the, the family that we're born into, or we don't have control over like what religion we're raised or what, you know, the, the color of our skin or, or, or you know, what we look like uh, to some degree. But I, I think you understand what I'm saying. So yeah, I get it. like I get it. how, how much ownership can we take? And at what point <laughs> is it like, knowing the things you can control versus knowing the things you can't. Yeah. And, yeah. and so yeah, that's an amazing question. It's an insightful question because there's the whole concept and, you know, we've heard people say, you know, you've got to take a hundred percent responsibility for everything in your life. You are the source of everything in your life. And so if I were to go back and say, all right, am I the source of my father committing suicide? Well, I'm not the source of that but I am the source of my response to it, right? So what happens is we, we can either be a victim or we can take responsibility. Most people, and I've done this myself, I still have to catch myself in this, is getting into victim mode and saying, all right, well, I had no choice. I was victimized because my father left me at the, uh, library. I was, I was the victim. My father did wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not going to take responsibility for that. Well, who, all right. Whether we take responsibility, not take responsibility for the action that happened, what we do have to take responsibility is our interpretation of it. The story that we create because of what happened, um, and take ownership of our response. So we can't control circumstances, only control our response to the circumstances. And so that's the, I think the important piece is not playing victim to the things that happen. And, you know, we do that when, you know, we, we have this whole thing of like uh, justification. So because, my, I got laid off, then this is why I'm broke. And you live in a victim mentality and there's a lot of benefits. I think it's important that we look at what are the benefits that we get from being a victim? Well, we get sympathy, <laughs> we get attention, we get recognition, we get love from you know, our parents or whoever who feel sorry for us. And so as long as, so we are getting some benefits, you got to look at, all right, what are the positive benefits of being in a victim mode, but realize that even though you're getting those victims, you're releasing all of your personal power to change the situation. So yes, I got laid off, um, but I've got to take responsibility for that. Not that I'm wrong. I don't have to make myself wrong. It's not a shame on me that I got laid off or shame on you that you got laid off, but you take responsibility. Well, you did take that job in that industry. And if you take responsibility for getting laid off, you have a responsibility for getting into a, a better situation where you're not going to get laid off again take ownership and you can personal power um, and choose to have personal power as the benefit versus the benefits of being a victim. Now, there's a lot of other, there's, there's the easy ones that I just mentioned, the attention and sympathy and love and all those things, but there's also others, uh, your ability to manipulate others. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you're a victim you got laid off, you live in a bad state and you have a wife that you yell at or kids that you yell at, well, I have the right to be this way because I, I was victimized and I'm in an angry state and you should be understanding for me um, manipulating you or being negative towards you. So 
there's just so many things where when we play victim, not only does it empower our life, it helps us disempower other people's lives versus being the source or taking responsibility, then not only do we have the power to empower our own lives, but we'll be way more empowering to others. I love that answer. I love that answer. I've been searching for the for the the right way to articulate how I feel on that topic. And that was that was it. I mean, you just articulated exactly how I feel on it. So thank you very much for that. Awesome, brother. Yeah, and, of course. And so I guess the the next question uh, kind of along that same vein is when you are in the victim mentality or you are at you're at your low point and mm-hmm. you and and things are just not going right and you don't like like maybe this stuff makes sense logically but you're not living it, mm-hmm. right? How do you, at your lowest yeah. point, start that process of taking responsibility, like like climbing climbing that vine and and really starting it, especially when there's so much pain there? I mean, I cannot I cannot even begin to fathom how much pain you had to work through, and other people have to work through on a on a regular basis. And then, you know, and then it's like, okay, well now in addition to this pain, now you have all this work to do to get, to get, uh, you know, get over the pain or, or, or to work through the pain in a, in a healthy way. So how do you take that first step and really get the momentum working in your favor as opposed to digging you deeper and deeper into that hole? Yeah. So, well, it starts with the the first thing is just the awareness, right? So being aware that you are being a victim. <laughs> um, so that's one because most people are really unconscious to it. They're not thinking that they're being a victim. They're just they're just part of the drift. I mean, we're just drifting along, and our society makes it easy to just drift along and. Um, you know, we're not taught in school to be the source of everything in your life. I mean, I never had a class on responsibility. So um, number, number one is the awareness. Uh, number two is it's as simple as a choice. And the choice to be the source, stand in power, and live fully, being able to, you know, uh, uh, empower yourself to take the actions that you need to take versus being a victim. So it's a choice. So hopefully you have enough choice now to do it. Many people wait to make that leap, the leap from victimhood to responsibility. It's a leap. You've got to say, you know what? I'm, uh, I'm tired of living in victim mode. I'm tired of being the way I'm being, I'm going to make the leap to move into a new way of being, which is responsibility and the power. So you decide, do you want to um, make that leap now? Or do you want to wait until it gets so painful that you make the leap when the pain is greater? So many people don't make the choice until they're just so sick and tired of being sick and tired. The pain gets to such a high degree, then they decide, all right, enough is enough. Or that, you know what? I can just make this choice and I have the power to make the choice out of nothing. I, I, there's, I can just choose to make it because I understand it's the right thing to do. So it's really as simple as a choice and deciding, do you want to make the choice now or do you want to make the choice later when it's going to be, when your life is at a lower level? You know, it's like when I was $100,000 in debt, I had a business partner who uh, ran the, I ran sales and marketing, he ran the um, uh, operations and finance. And I got a call from one of our vendors one day and he's like, hey, when do you think you guys will be able to make that invoice payment? I'm like, what invoice payment? He said, you're $30,000 behind 
on our uh, leads that we bought for a marketing company. I had no idea. My partner didn't tell me. So I call my partner and I understand, all right, well, we're in debt. And long story short, we ended up 100,000 in debt. I ended up having to take over the company part ways. It wasn't real pretty, but it was what needed to happen. So I had the choice. It's like, it would have been easy for me to stay in victimhood and, because it wasn't my fault necessarily because I wasn't running the finances. I wasn't spending money we shouldn't have been spending. But as long as I'm being a victim saying it was his fault, then I don't have enough personal power to actually take over the company and make the changes that need to be made. So I had to decide to take responsibility versus what the alternative. So the question is, what is the alternative? And people are moved more to avoid pain and gain pleasure. So taking responsibility allows us to gain pleasure and gain personal power. So we got to ask ourselves, like, what's the pain of not taking responsibility of not deciding that you're the source. Well, in my case, in that business, it would have been me staying in the same situation, blaming him, going further in debt, filing bankruptcy and closing down the company. I would have been right. I would have been right because my victimhood allows me to give reasons and justifications for my own failure. It's like in a relationship. I, I am definitely not a relationship coach <laughs> by any means. One day I hope to be, one day I hope to be, right? But in a relationship and you know, I can tell you what not to do. So in my previous marriage, I'm divorced, right? So there were things that my ex would do that me, I didn't like. And I would be a victim of the things that she did. And anyone that I would talk to about it, and even after a divorce, they're like, oh, yeah, well, you're right. Well, you can be right or you can be happy. So a lot of times we hold on to this thing of being right more than being happy. Right? We want to hold on to our ego. We want to hold on to looking good for other people not being responsible for the source because we risk looking bad. We risk having that fracture our fragile little egos. So, you know, looking back, could I have had situations where I took responsibility as the source of her actions? And that probably would have moved things forward in a more positive manner, right? So um, it, I don't know that there is an answer. You know, we can't force anyone to make that decision, but we can give people insights that help them make that and helping them make a decision to take responsibility because without that, you at best stay in the same situation. More than likely, the situation gets worse because you remain in victimhood. So do you want freedom or do you want to be right? Do you want freedom or do you want to protect your ego? You know, it, it, that becomes a much uh, simpler decision when it's framed like that. It really, really does. So when you were when you were taking the action of going to the bookstore every day and reading, reading and reading and reading and remembering the page and going back and reading some more, finishing the books, what were and it, and I know we've talked a lot about taking responsibility. Um, and of course that's that very, very basic summary does not encapsulate everything we just talked about. But in addition to what we've talked about, what other critical lessons or lessons did you learn and shifts did you make, uh, from your, from your reading and your learning and your research? Yeah. And a great question. So one of the biggest aha moments that I had, it actually happened when I was living out of my car, I read a couple different books. Um, one I had actually read before and I read it again. It was What to Say When You Talk to Yourself by Shad Helmstetter. Another one was uh, Mock 2 With Your Hair on Fire by uh, now a friend of mine, Richard Brooke. And they're, they're both a similar feel. What to Say When You Talk to Yourself is um, kind of goes deeper. 
Um, in the first time I read it, um, I'd read it before I was living out of my car, but I kind of like skimmed through it. I heard him speak at an event. And so I got the book and I like went through it, but you know, it's sometimes you need to read with a new set of eyes or you need to listen with a new set of ears. When I was homeless living out of my car, I was really looking for something. And I, it was like, all right, I got to take responsibility for creating change in my life versus just hoping something is going to make my life better. And, you know, both the books really talked about your personal vision and, um, you know, the Mach 2 with your hair on fire, Richard, his story was he went from working in a chicken plant and he went from working in a chicken plant to becoming this multimillionaire. And, you know, his vision for his life, his belief system about himself was that he deserved to be working in a chicken plant. And if you want uh, greater results for your life, you've got to believe that you're worthy of greater results. You've got to change the vision for your life and who you are. And uh, what to say when you talk to yourself, it goes through a lot of the behavioral psychology of, you know, what creates actions. Obviously, we have to create positive actions if we want positive results. Well, most people, many people set goals, and this is not necessarily from the book, but we set goals and we don't do the things in our goals. We don't do the actions. We don't do our action plans. So we beat ourselves up. We set goals again. We don't do the action. We beat ourselves up. We reset our goals. We don't do the action. We beat ourselves up. We reset goals, right? So it's a never ending process. And so the book, what to say when you talk to yourself goes a little deeper. Well, where do actions come from? Actions come from feelings. So if you feel motivated, if you feel confident, if you feel certain, then you're more likely to take the actions. Well, where do feelings come from? Feelings come from your thoughts and your beliefs. So if you have a powerful belief about who you are, you're more likely to feel confident, which makes you more likely to take the actions, which makes you more likely to create positive results in your life. So we've got to go deeper. So we go not just the actions you need to take, but what are the beliefs you need to have? And then we got to go deeper than that. And we got to figure out where do beliefs come from and beliefs come from your programming. So we have experiences that we've had. We have external conversations, external programming, and then we have internal conversations and internal programming. So you get to the root and what many people do. It's like if you had a peach tree and your or a tomato plant, let's call it a tomato plant, and your tomatoes coming out and they're kind of spoiled. Well, the way most people operate is they spray some water on it and they try to shine up the tomato. And that doesn't make the tomato any better. It, more bad tomatoes come. So we all kind of know intuitively, we got to go to the roots. We got to go to the tomato plant and we got to go to the roots. It's what we're watering. It's how we're watering or what we're doing, the nutrients that are feeding the tomato plant. So we kind of, it's not real intuitive to think about that for ourselves. So we got to go to the root. Well, what's the programming? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's um, what are the things that we're consistently saying about ourselves? Well, but ne what negative programming or positive programming are we allowing in? So, you know, we're speaking to the choir here because the listeners of your show here, they're positively programming themselves. They're feeding their roots. And by feeding your roots consistently, you're going to have a stronger belief system, stronger thoughts, stronger feelings, which produce stronger actions. So that was a big distinction for me was just understanding how, that I needed to change my belief system. How I change that is through my conversation. So I've got to start saying things as if they were already true uh, to program myself to believe that because we've got two minds. We have a conscious mind and we have a subconscious mind and all the science says that the subconscious is infinitely thousands of times more powerful than the conscious mind. So your belief system, your identity, there's a thing called the law of consistency and commitment. We will be committed to remaining consistent with who we believe we really are. 
And if you believe you really are someone who struggles financially, you're always going to find a way to struggle. If you believe you're a $40,000 a year person, you're going to find a way to make $40,000 a year. But if you only believe that you are a hundred thousand a year producer, a million dollar a year producer, what's going to happen is feelings kick in because of your belief. So feelings of motivation and certainty and a sense of urgency and all that kick in to get you in line with your belief system. So your results will be in line with your belief system. And so when your belief is up here and your results are down here, natural motivation kicks in. The challenge is why people are not naturally motivated because their results are consistent with their belief. So if you want natural motivation to kick in, you got to change your belief system. Now there's also the opposite is true. So, and I've seen this in, you know, leading sales teams at, around the world. And, you, you know, I currently have sales teams in over 40 countries, right? And so some people will come in and have a lot of just hard work, work ethic, natural career and they end up having a good amount of success and they're making more money than they've made before, which, but they never took the time to change their belief system. And so they're having greater results than their belief. And so sabotage, self-sabotage kicks in and brings the results down to their belief system. So we got to be mindful of always programming our subconscious to be powerful or our identity to be powerful. You may have a conscious goal of being a millionaire, but you have a subconscious belief system that is saying, who the hell are you to be a millionaire? And you got these two minds with different goals. Consciously, I want to be a millionaire, but subconsciously, the goal is to keep you in line with your identity. Well, which goal wins? Subconscious, subconscious goal wins every time. You got it. So that was uh, a very, you know, it was a powerful distinction is uh is really working on my belief system and you know having the awareness of the things that i was saying consistently that held me back i believed that money was hard to come by i was raised by a single mom who worked two jobs um, she became an attorney and even when she became an attorney when i was in high school she still worked a part-time job on the side because the job she got as an attorney only paid like forty thousand a year and she wanted to live in a nice neighborhood and all this so she still worked a part-time job so like she did this amazing thing and money was still hard to come by. So that was my programming. And so I had to rewire myself. I was, I would say things like, man, why am I so broke? Um, there's just not enough time in the day. All these little things that we think are just not real important. Everything you say about yourself makes it more true. So you got to be very conscious of the negative things that you're saying about yourself because you're programming yourself to be less powerful every time you do that. So two questions there. And I believe that what you just said was incredibly insightful and very powerful. And there was a lot there. So I'd highly encourage everybody who's watching and listening to actually rewind that a couple times and really let that sink in because I mean, you, you just gave them the, the keys to changing their lives, by the way. Um, which I know you know that, but I just wanted to make sure everybody who's listening and watching realizes like that, that is what you just heard. Uh, so, so my question then is how do we, a two part question first, how do we identify consciously identify what we subconsciously believe? And is it ever too late to change and upgrade ourselves, better ourselves, create that better life. So I'm going to answer number two first. And <laughs> I, I don't think it's ever too late. Um, you know, we are, I mean, I just think that's what the gift that we've get, been given from God is potential. Um, you know, I mean, we're, we're always given that potential and I believe we're incredibly powerful, way more powerful than we even understand. So it's never too late. Uh, God's gift to us is potential. Our gift to him is using the potential, right? And um, so question number one, and so I, now I've forgotten question number one, answering question number two. <laughs> How do we consciously identify our subconscious? Oh, how do we con okay, so great. 
uh, sorry, um, is number one, you look at your results. So your belief system is going to be in line with your results. So where are you financially? And if you're broke, you've got a broke mindset. Now you may be up to changing that. You may be in the process of changing it, but based on your results, you're still there. So, um, you know, that is a big stuff. Look at your results. So when it comes to your health and fitness, um, where are you at? If you're extremely overweight, you have some serious limiting beliefs about your health. You may be stuck in victim mode believing that it's hereditary. Well, that's bullshit. It's not hereditary, but that's your victimhood. That's you being a victim, making justifications for your situation. So how long do you want to continue doing that? You can hold on to being right and fat and get heart disease. You can do that and you'll be right. And we'll protect your little ego. <laughs> or you can choose, make a choice now to stand in power and take responsibility for the fact that your belief systems are a little screwed up and you need to change them. And you need to be the source of you and your health as it stands right now. And if you're the source of your health and fitness right now, you're also the source and you have the power and you have the freedom to change it. So you can choose that or choose to be a victim and continue on the same path, which will probably get worse, okay? Um, so that's it. I mean, the bottom line is your results. You can, um, you know, look at things like I, um, train salespeople in the direct selling industry. And, you know, you, you, I can say salespeople are fill in the blank. <laughs> and now if you're a salesperson and I say salespeople are fill in the blank and sleazy comes to mind, guess what? You're not going to be a very person because you've got a, a belief, maybe a small one, but it's there that salespeople are sleazy. Um, so you can do a, a belief analysis and you can, you know, write down money is blank. Well, what's the, well, the first thing that comes to mind when I say money is maybe it's awesome. the root of all evil. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. You got a little blockage there. Rich people are blank. What's the first thing that comes to mind? And so you can do that in a lot of different areas. So choose the ways that you want to be empowered, that you want your life to improve. Maybe it's money, maybe it's relationships, maybe it's finances. Um, relationships are blank. Commitment is blank. Marriage is blank. And if you have negative things that are popping up, that's something you got to look at and you got to make a change. So in making the change, how do you do that? Number one, let's, let's have awareness of, how we're fucked up. Okay. So now that I'm aware, all right, I'm fucked up. I don't have to stay there. It's okay. You take responsibility for it. You're not wrong. You just are. It just is what it is. So I take responsibility for it. Now I have the power to change. So then the question becomes, if I could be anyone in the world as it relates to money, relationships, speaking, salesmanship, authorship, as a parent, what would it be? What does that look like? So um, I, as an example, in building sales teams, years ago, I was a lousy leader. I didn't believe I could lead anyone. So I would never be able to recruit any powerful salespeople. So I said, all right, how do I change this? Well, I got to change my belief because my results, my results were in line with my belief. So if I want to change my results, I got to change my belief. So I created a thing. Well, if I could be anyone, who would it be? I would be a powerful leader that every other powerful leader wants to work with. I would be a, a leader that other leaders want to work with. And so I created that as an affirmation and I started saying it 50 times a day. Every time I go into an appointment, I would say it. Um, you know, people naturally want to buy whatever I'm selling. You know, when I'm struggling as a salesperson, I start saying people naturally want to buy whatever I'm, I'm selling. I build instant rapport when I meet people, whatever it may be. Now, as a speaker, and there's so much power in this, I don't even understand it, but it's programming. We're programming our subconscious mind. We're putting it out there. 
to create results. So many cases, I could give you so many different examples where, you know, one, this was one of the, like, I couldn't believe that it happened. I've been, I had been a speaker for 15 years, 15 years, I've been traveling around speaking, confident in my abilities and all this. And I do a lot of like speaker affirmations before I get on stage. Uh, I touch, move and inspire people. I light people up. Um, and so I'm doing some speaker affirmations and I create a new one. And the new one was, I'm like, I'm thinking about my intention. Today, I wanna to hit people right in the heart. I want my message to hit them in the heart. So for the first time ever, I started saying, I hit people right in the heart. I hit people right in the heart. I hit people right in the heart. And I'm visualizing my words hitting people on the heart, right? So I'm visualizing what I want to happen. I go up, I do my talk. I, the last speaker at the event, close it out. It was great. I get off stage. People are wanting, you know, pictures and signing my book and stuff like that. And there's a crowd around me and there's, I see this, um, blonde lady who's just like looking at me from a distance. She's away from the crowd. And I'm like, well, it's interesting because she's like looking right at me, but she's with this group. So anyway, she waits the whole time. Everyone finishes, no one's there. And then finally she comes up and she says, hey, I just wanted to tell you personally, at one point in your talk, I felt like a truck hit me right in my heart. Now I had never heard anyone tell me anything about getting hit in the heart. And I had never said that affirmation before. So is it coincidence that the first time I ever said that affirmation, right before I got on stage, the results literally manifested themselves immediately. And I'm like goosebumps. I'm like, tears are like, like I'm, my eyes are getting watery because all the stuff that I've been talking about and telling other people to do, and I've been doing myself, it just immediately manifest. I'd never had it manifest that quickly. And I've had a lot of other examples. I mean, I came in to speak and do a training for a sales leader one time to his organization. And so I flew out to California, I did the event, he did the event with me, and I had just created, within the last three weeks, I had created an affirmation that said, I'm the motivator to the motivators. So I wanted to elevate my game, and if I wanna elevate my game and I wanna move, be able to move powerful people, I've gotta make that my belief system about me. I gotta make that my identity. I gotta program myself to believe I'm the person who does that. So I start saying this every day, every day, every day. I'm the motivator to the motivators. I'm the motivator to the motivators. At the end of the talk, he comes to me and he goes, man, I did not expect this to happen today. But, and this was a guy that I looked up to, right? Amazing speaker and trainer. I didn't expect this to happen. I mean, I just like, I wanted you to train my organization because they hear from me all the time. But man, you gave me what I needed to hear today. You know, it was like, that was, that was the affirmation manifesting itself three weeks after I decided to start saying it. And I could give you a bunch of different examples, but uh, um, you'll be surprised at how quickly the results can manifest. And don't get, the, there's been others that have taken a lot longer. There's still some that haven't manifested at all. But I realized that um, there's, there's nothing negative that can happen by programming yourself in a powerful way. Um, there's only something neg negative that can happen by not. So that's, uh, that's my long answer to your question. Well, I love long answers to my questions because there's so much nuance here and, and, and there's so much power in what you're saying. And it's so important. Please, please go into the long answers because the, the people need to hear it. Um, so at this point, Having done work for years and years and years and years, read a ton of books, uh, you know, worked with people, talked with people, what questions do you still have about yourself? So I think the biggest question I have about myself is probably the, uh, you know, my own potential. So what has been kind of my mission purpose of my life for a long time. Part of my mission has been living up to my highest potential, um, being in the process of living up to my highest potential. And, um, you know, it's, um, I think it's understanding the, uh, the capacity that I have 
to affect change. So what really moves me is not just living up to my own highest potential, helping others live up to theirs. So that's really, I mean, if I've got a calling, it's to help people live up to their potential. Um, and so uh, it's, you know, on what level can I do that? Um, and I'm always learning. I mean, I just within the last month, as an example, um, have had insights about myself. And so I'm, I mean, I just find it fascinating at 43 years old now. I just had a birthday. Um, at 43, I'm still finding out about myself. And that happens because I am so much in a learning mode. And I've gone off and on over the years. I've been pretty consistently in a growth mode for most of my adult life it's less and there's phases where it's more. And over the last couple months, it's been really high level. I mean, I've invested just this year, tens of thousands of dollars into my own education, uh, you know, through coaches and seminars and workshops and things like that. And so I've had some of the biggest insights that I've had in a long time because I've upped my game from a learning standpoint and from a personal growth standpoint. So, um, I'm in discovery. Matt, you kind of you kind of cut out on us for a second. Myself is. Uh, Folks, this is what happens when it's live. Fashion a, people. Hey, yeah, uh, yeah, you, you kind of cut out on us a little bit. Oh, all right, Let's we're see. back. How is it we're now? Back. Is it back? So yep. I think the uh, the sum it up. The question is, uh, you know, how deep of a change can I affect in people, and on how large of a scale can I affect that change? You know, um, I'm not um, I'm not interested in just doing it on a large scale. Um, I want to do it on a large scale, but also on a very deep level, allowing people to really change the context of their life. And so, you know, you go to a lot of events or you listen to uh, podcasts or whatever it is. And in many cases, it's uh, the conversation is more, better, different. So I'm going to go to a seminar and I'm going to learn some additional strategies and um, I'll make more money. My life will be different. So what excites me is creating transformation so that I'm able to help people step into a new way of being. So uh, to, to essentially to have a context of scarcity, you can work, work, you can learn some additional skills, some additional techniques, but if your context is scarcity, you're not going to create a lot of abundance. What's going to create a lot of abundance is changing your context from a place of scarcity to a place of abundance. It's like if the desert were the uh, context, you had to plant tulips in the desert, the tulips are going to die. They may be the most beautiful tulips you've ever seen, but you plant them in the wrong context and they die. So you've got to change your context and then the effort that you put in, it's not a, it's not a more or different situation, it's a radical change. And so I wanna be able to affect radical change in people's lives. So that's uh, one of the big questions I have is how can I do that on a, uh, a deeper and a larger scale? So, Matt, I wanna I wanna thank you very very much um, for uh, for coming on the show today, and uh, you know I wanna be very respectful of your time, um, and um, I'm I'm deeply grateful for the time we have been able to share together. I think it's been a very powerful conversation, and uh, I do have one more question for you, um, and I wanna ask specifically from my perspective, and I'm 24 years old, and I wanna know what question should I be asking you that I just wouldn't think to ask? Mm. 
Man, I got to tell you, the questions that you've asked, I've done a lot of, you know, different podcasts and radio shows and stuff like that. And you've, uh, I, I think you've asked the most powerful questions I've ever been asked on, uh, on a show. So I can tell you are up to really big things. I can tell your passion, your commitment, your conviction and what you do. Uh, I feel it. I mean, even over the internet just to ask, man, I think you've asked some amazing like questions. Now you've stumped me. Um, <laughs> um, man, really, I think you've asked them if I could, because typically people aren't asking the question that would normally be an easy question to ask. It really would. And in this case, You've asked such powerful questions. I really, I can't think of one. If one comes to me later, I'll send it to you personally. Wonderful. Well, uh, I appreciate um, the kind words. And uh, again, I, you know, I'm just very thankful that, um, you know, that you came in on the show and, and uh, that we could have this discussion. It's been very meaningful. Uh, and, and I just want to say thank you very, very much. Absolutely. Well, my pleasure. I appreciate you having me on and I appreciate what you're up to. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, to everybody who's watching and listening, I want to express my gratitude for y'all. Uh, y'all the reason that I do this. And, uh, you know, this has been a very powerful conversation. So uh, I would highly encourage you all to go back and listen through a couple times. Um, this, this one was heavy in, in a very good way. Uh, with a lot of a lot of very powerful information. So you know, I highly encourage all to again, go back through a couple times, really pick through each one uh, and, and let it sink in. So uh, thank you again, Matt. Thank you to everybody watching and listening. And I will see all of you on the next episode.